to stay here in front of this mic, which I'd prefer not to, but it's kind of like church. Everybody's in the last rows. So um, I might leave this mic and just try and talk loud, and I hope you don't mind. Um, first, can I, I understand that there are hospitality management people here and entrepreneurism. What, I just want to know kind of the ratio to know if I'm going to hit this right. The, can you just show me Raise a hand. Who's here for hospitality? Okay. Now, entrepreneurism. I hear you guys have to go for a class, right? So that's why. Uh, any, other, any other groups, any other majors here that? Okay. All right. Well, I have to admit what I'm going to talk about today is probably slanted towards the um, entrepreneurism side. But obviously, being with the Polynesian Cultural Center, I have a good deal to say about uh, tourism also. Um, first of all, I got three pieces of advice. I don't think these are like the three most important pieces of advice you could get in your whole life. I don't think they're necessarily the top three. I think there are three important things that I've learned that I hope with I can share with you that will be of value to you. All right? So those three are keep filling your toolbox, know the customer best, and pray for help. Again, these are just, just three that I think could be really helpful to you. Let's start with, but as I go throughout this presentation today, what I'm going to do is present some experiences that I've had and see if there's not something that you can learn from those. But I'm going to hope to present it in a cars kind of format because I'd like to model that for you because I believe that's critical for you to understand as you're interviewing with companies to, to talk about your experiences in this cars, that circumstances, the actions you took based on those in those circumstances and the results that came from those. Does that make sense? Are you familiar with this? Maybe this is old news to you, but I'm telling you, if you could do that, if you could talk about your experiences in this way, you'll, be, you'll do very well in any job interviews. So I'm going to attempt to do that, see, see, if, see how well I do. First, keep filling your toolbox. I, this was a piece of advice that came to me from my grandfather. I hadn't spent a lot of time with him. There are lots of seats up here in the front. Um, so my grandfather was a, an engineer and conductor for, I believe it was Union Pacific Railroad. I was starting business school for my MBA, and I, he, I wasn't sure what advice he could give me on a career that would really be relevant. But he told me just one thing, just build your toolbox. And that has stuck with me all of my years and I actually took it to heart while in graduate school and picked up a lot of things that I put in my toolbox and realized I had a lot of things in there from undergrad. And it has made all the difference in my career. And so let me give you a couple examples. Pocket margin. I worked for Dow Chemical. It's a Fortune 50 company. It's now Dow DuPont and the number two chemical company in the world. It's always vying for top one or two. That's a heated thing between BASF. So the number two chemical company. Now you hear chemical and you may think nasty. Uh, mean, nasty, bad stuff, chemical company. I'm telling you, it's not what you think it is. So let me try and show you the difference there. And also as I go through I want to tell you that there's more than, more than one way to be an entrepreneur. So I was hired by the Dow Chemical Company out of grad school because I had entrepreneurial experience prior to school. I was really different. I came from Hawaii over here and, and, and had travel tourism experience from the Polynesian Culture Center. I lived in Japan. This guy is different, and we want different in this company. So I came into a management rotation program that was 
really entrepreneurial. They would let us start, you'd go into a business and you'd start a business and get it going, you'd run it, and then you'd either continue to lead that business or move on. So this was one of the first projects I had there. I had six months there. And again, a little bit more of the situation, Dow Chemical Company, huge company, very complicated, thousands and thousands of customers for each small business, for each a small business meaning $100 million. So they kind of lost control of that. There was a consulting company doing work in one of those businesses in the polyurethanes business. And this consulting work they were doing to help them optimize their business, optimize their margin, was costing them about a million dollars a month in consulting fees. I was in another business, specialty chemicals business, about the same size. And we looked at what they were doing and I said, we can do that. I can do what they're doing. There's nothing secret about that stuff. I had the Excel skills from school from here. I had been using Excel extensively. I used pivot tables. I used and I had learned database management and of course PowerPoint and I had communication skills. So we could do this. So we leveraged what we saw happening in that business over to this other business and we, it was called a pocket margin project. And we looked at the margin that goes into your pocket after everything, trying to account for every expense, what really goes into the pocket of the business. And what we found is that it almost every business looked like this. If you take the first company or customer, there's a margin they contributed to the business. The second biggest customer contributed that much margin. The third company contributed that much margin. Almost every business looked like this and you had thousands of customers. And 80% of the margin came from 20% of the customers. Vary it a couple percent either way, that's just how it went. Where do you think the complexity and the cost of that business came from? It's not dealing with that first 20 percent. It's dealing with the whole tail there. You've got thousands of little customers that make the same kind of demands often as the big customers. You make little to no margin off of it. In fact, some of them you'd lose margin. So immediately, we did, this, we did this analysis for the business, for hundreds of products, hundreds of different, thousands of customers, and, and maxed out Excel. Fortunately, they've increased the capability. But um, we were able to help those businesses by removing that tail. We moved those customers to distribution. Let distributors handle them. They handle it much better at a better margin. We don't worry about it. We simplified the business, got rid of the, the negative margin customers immediately. So we helped save the company hundreds of thousands. No, this, this project was millions of dollars in cost savings over the life of that project. And I, I, I can't give you exact numbers. One, because I don't remember exactly what they were. Other is I would still probably get shot if I did. So, that was one example of using those tools that I gained, collected in my time here and in Provo. Here's another one. Um, so again, hoping to change your perspective a little what a company like Dow Chemical looks like. They actually have a water and process solutions business where they set up giant plant, well, it's, it's anywhere from small filtration, a good example, reverse osmosis. So ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, osmosis, ion exchange resins here. That whole package can work together. That reverse osmosis is what they use on the shuttlecraft to filter urine to make it drinkable water. I don't know, that doesn't sound very appetizing, I know. It might sound a little bit better if you could filter ocean water to make it drinkable water. Now that sounds a little more accessible. I have been in plants that put the pipe in the ocean, they run it through this plant and it pops out uh, briny water and nice drinkable water in quantities large enough to satisfy whole municipalities. That technology exists and it's growing as the cost of water increases. And Dow Science made that possible. 
So working for this company, they asked me to come in early again in my career and they said, help us figure out what other kinds of businesses we could be doing. Are there service businesses? How could we extend here? What kind of new business could we start up? So they had this business. These are small RO filters. You might have seen something like that before. They have these, these uh, rings here, it pops into a system, good water, or, or bad water comes in, good water comes out, and briny or brackish water comes out also and, as waste. Well, they have the same version of that, but in five foot lengths, giant elements that again, go to municipalities or power plants or anywhere they have to deal with large quantities of water. So that's the circumstance. How do we start new businesses? The actions we took were to go and look and I wasn't sure where to begin. We started interviewing customers, uh, people who used our product, looked all around. And I was in a presentation one day, Clayton Christensen was presenting to the Dow Chemical Company. I don't know if you've heard of him. The guy's brilliant and an awesome, just an all around genuine awesome guy. He was talking and he talked about a book he was gonna be writing, a follow up to his Innovator's Dilemma, which was Innovator's Solution. And in that book, he talked about one chapter called Outcome Driven Innovation. And I remember it just stuck in my mind, well, what the heck is that? I want to know more about what that process is. Sounds like something I need. So I looked into it, learned more and more about it. I talked to the author of this book, who later published this book and is now available. And I have the picture here for you because I think that book is well worth the read. If you're in entrepreneurship, or I, even if you're in hospitality management, it is well worth your exposure to these principles. It talks about a process where you can create innovation, create an innovation process. Helped tremendously. I was able to go and introduce this, not just to that water business, but to the entire Dow Chemical Company. And they are still using this today as I talk to people. It's, um, and I don't, we don't have time to go into that process today. I'm not here to teach you about it. The point I want to make is I saw that as another set of tools I needed to put into my toolbox. Hugely beneficial set. What the outcome of this was I was able to go and interview customers and found out that they needed a better way to get the small parts to go to implement all of these bigger and small elements. All these little O-rings here, they, the shipping department at Dow Chemical ships out these giant orders of the giant elements. Every order costs them about $250 to $500 to process an order. So what happens when the poor guy wants to order that O-ring? It takes two weeks and it costs the company $250 to process that order. They weren't set up for it. But you know what? I had worked for the Polynesian Cultural Center. And at the Polynesian Cultural Center, I had set up catalog mail order. And I knew that there were companies that do catalog mail order, third party distribution and shipping at $3 an order. We just shipped all of our stuff to them. They set it up instantly. We had 24 hour response time at $3 an order. Saved the company <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars in shipping and started a whole new business for them in direct to market, direct to market sales that they hadn't have been able to be in before because the market was really quite diverse. There was no customer that dominated that would have stopped you from selling those items directly to the market. Does that make sense? So the company could sell direct to customers. So again, started a new business, couple new businesses for them doing that. But again, this was because of these tools allowed us to go and find those things that were interesting and needed by the customer. So second, so know the customer best. I tried to think of a more clever way to say this. There's gotta be, if anybody has a better idea after this thing, I'd love to hear. What I mean by know the customer best is he who knows the customer better than everyone else wins. They win in the value chain. This is why Walmart is so flippin' powerful. 
They know exactly what the customers are buying, how much they're buying, and at what price they're buying. That is very hard to beat. So let me tell you the first experience where I got a, a hard lesson in this. It was in the swimwear industry, believe it or not. Dow had developed a new fiber that was chlorine resistant. It was like Lycra. You, you know Lycra, spandex, it's in everything now. Well, um, you may notice that as you wash that stuff, it loses stretch. It doesn't stand up to heat. Chlorine kills it. So high performance swimwear is where you use tons of it and it just didn't last. It, it sounds small, but swimwear is a $14 billion industry. Not small potatoes and a big chunk of that is this kind of fiber. So Dow comes out with this great <coughs> XLA fiber. Beats anything on the market. So I traveled to Italy to talk to manufacturers of fabric that go into swimwear. I traveled to the textile manufacturers that use that fabric to make the swimwear. I talked with Janssen, Speedo Management, all their product development. They, they loved it, but DuPont, darn DuPont. DuPont had things so tight. They knew exactly what everyone at every level of the value chain wanted and needed. The guy in Italy ran the, the plant. He wasn't interested in, new, in a new fiber because it had benefits because he got royalty payments from down the line. He wasn't gonna move, he'd lose his payments. He also got special processing support by DuPont that helped him. He had no interest in, if it came through DuPont, he might be interested. We go to the next level, fabric manufacturers, not interested, Walmart says we gotta use this. And we go to Walmart and they said, no, nope, we're not interested in DuPont, we like our relationship with DuPont. They knew at every level of that value chain what that customer wanted, all the way to the end customer where they created pull through. So you as a consumer said, oh, quality brand has got DuPont Lycra on here, not the cheap spandex. That's a good quality swimsuit, I want that. So they had this whole thing locked up and we had a very difficult time getting a superior product into the market because we didn't understand the customer anywhere near as well as DuPont had. Another example, quickly. This sounds like really boring stuff. Glycerin, glycerin here, that's glycerin. It looks like thick water. That is about as boring as you could possibly get as a product to sell. So Dow had a plant, had several plants that created glycerin and it's a synthetic glycerin. And they said, um, well, in Europe and in America, the biodiesel market, I don't know if you've looked at that at all, the biodiesel market where they take natural you know, cane or corn stalk or whatever, leftover green waste, they process it and they make fuel, right? Ethanol. But one of the streams that comes out of that same production is glycerin. Nobody wanted as much glycerin as was popping out. So Dow has these synthetic plants making glycerin that's a very pure, good glycerin, but you got all this natural glycerin coming out. So anywhere that used glycerin, it seemed like this stuff's almost free. In fact, some places were paying to get rid of it. Dow went from about $1.50 a pound down to like seven cents a pound. And it cost them, I believe, about 14 cents a pound to make. You can't do that very long, right? So they ended up having to shut plants down. That's a situation. <clears throat> then they got a call once they shut a few plants down and they had one plant left open in Stade, Germany. And they said, if you shut this plant down, we're gonna call the World Health Organization and protest. And management was like, why? Why would you do that? This stuff makes mattresses. What does this have to do with mattresses? Well, it doesn't only make mattresses. 
it goes into um, insulin production. It is a critical component in insulin. And by the way, natural glycerin doesn't work. Too many impurities. Synthetic glycerin is the only thing pure enough and you have to have it. Global insulin production would be stopped if you stopped producing. We're like, we had no idea. We're selling it at seven cents a pound. And by the rail car, and we've got some customers that are buying this by rail car, and they're putting it in little medical packaging and selling it at more than $1,000 a pound. And we realized we didn't know what we were doing. So I was asked to go in and lead that plant at that time, keep it from shutting down, find out everything we could about this industry, what can we do to better serve it, to get involved more, better understand the customer because there was more value for us. And how it turns out is the uh, insulin manufacturers of the world, the Merricks and et cetera, they said, we will help you keep that plant open and we'll pay you for the production in that plant. And so for us, it went to $1,000 a pound. Now, at least you think that sounds like gouging. That's what it cost to keep that plant open. And we were about to shutter that plant. It was going down and all the staff that was in that plant were about to lose their jobs and it would close. And this way, and, and by the way, a drum of insulin is about a million dollars. 55 gallon drum is about a million dollars in retail value. So a thousand bucks a pound for the glycerin, a large component, that was nothing. And by the way, so since this is synthetic, it allowed insulin to be shelf stable for two years where anything else would be less than about six months. So it was incredibly critical. But again, we didn't know the customer. We had to get in there, learn more about the customer. Let me give you a PCC example. So PCC, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more later for those who are hospitality management. I gotta make sure we include more of that type of thing. But this, is, this was our current ad campaign as of a, a two, roughly two and a half years ago. Um, and when we advertise in, on island in trade publications, you can only do so at a quarter at a time. Once you put your ad in, it's in there for three months. David Priest knows this very well. He had this job long ago, and you are stuck for a quarter once that ad goes in, or trimester. And so if you make a mistake, you gotta live with it for three months, right? So it's so slow and backward, I, I don't know, it's, it's Hawaii business. Um, so we did some testing. We researched with our customers. And, and I'll, again, I'll tell you more of the circumstances around PCC in a, in a few minutes. But um, we weren't doing well. PCC was not doing well. We needed to do better. We had to do better. And we did research with customers to try and find out more of what they wanted. We, we got rid of one ad agency and started with a new ad agency just to see if we could get a clean start. They came up with a new ad campaign. I'm sorry this is tiny. I didn't necessarily mean for you to compare ads, but they came up with a campaign or with ideas for ads. Now, if we were to just trust ourselves, I think everybody there, well, I don't know. Think in your mind, what, which one would you have picked? Which one would you have gone with? And I'll tell you which one. So, our ad agency really liked the, the guy on the coconut tree. That's who they were pushing us hard to go with this campaign. And you can't see the words there, but it says, you know, hula, spear throwing, fire making, all the kind of fun things you get at PCC, just fill in the blank. That's what they really, really wanted. They loved it, it was clever, fun. And for some experiences I had showed, have proven to me that we can't be trusted, right? 
We live here. We don't know what customers think. We have to go to the customer to find out what the customer thinks. So we had, to, we had significant focus groups to review this with them. I don't think any of us would have thought that was the winner. By far, by far that one won over all of the others. And what we've learned from this and from after was that people really want to use their time. They, they don't have time. They've got more money than they've got time. They're very careful about what they're going to do and they've got to get the biggest bang for their buck and for their minutes on island. And this really appealed to them. They could do all those things at one place in one day. So we've had subsequent marketing agencies that we've worked with come back to us and say, okay, we can beat that. that so we ran with this ad campaign, that all this one place. We ran with it, we saw great improvement. And again, we had other ad agencies come in and they say, ah, oh, we can do better than that. We're much more clever, we have great, we've got smart people, and we can top that. Bring it on, bring it on, but it's not going in any publication till it's tested against the baseline. So this one was first tested against our original ad, right, did much better. Now everything now gets tested against this one. I remember the look on their faces as we're going through these focus groups, this next agency. Nothing compared to this ad. Everybody would gravitate to this one. Oh, we like that one the best. That one speaks in it. They just, they'd just be crestfallen, <laughs> sad, we've failed, and nothing worked. But nothing is going to go in a publication that we spend literally hundreds of thousands of dollars for and we get locked into and dictate our performance for the next three months unless the customer tells us that's the best thing to do. Does that make sense? So the third point and my last point here, and I'm so glad to be speaking to you here in this audience because this is not a conversation we could have easily at another university. But I'm telling you, you have access to help and support and the guidance of the Spirit that not many people know or at least recognize. Does that make sense? I'm, I implore you, as you look, I know your Heavenly Father cares about your success. I remember thinking, does he really care about Dow Chemical success? And I came to learn, yes, because he cares about my success, and he cares about my family's success, and our livelihood, and our future. He will help me to be successful. Does that make sense? I'm asking you to make sure you don't overlook that source of help, support, wisdom, as you are working in your work life. Let me give two quick examples. The global trade of coated paper, my very first job going into this management rotation program in Dow Chemical, my boss said, hey, welcome, here's your little office, and your first project for the next six months is, we want you to develop a model for the global trade of coated papers. He said, uh, and you know, you got six months and he left. And I just remember my head spinning like, what did he even say? I don't know what he's even talking about. What is a coded paper? Global, global trade, I think I get that part of it. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Oh, and by the way, I learned later that they had just gotten a model back from the world's foremost consulting authority in the paper industry and it wasn't satisfactory. And I was at a loss. I didn't know what to do. I remember spending four months, four months going throughout the industry, interviewing people in the industry, learning everything I could about it. Four months down, I've got two to go and I don't have a single clue what to do. I, I'm at a loss. I looked at what the other company had given them, looked all right, tried to find out why it was wrong. So, turns out, coated paper, these giant mills. Any magazine is printed on coated paper. Packaging is coated paper. 
All that paper has a coating on it. It includes latex. Latex produced by the Dow Chemical Company. Includes a lot of water. You have to set up those latex plants next to a paper plant, a paper mill. So they needed to know where these mills were gonna be so they know where to put a latex plant. So you're asking me, the guy who just got out of school, where you're gonna build a $500 million latex plant. And we're supposed to model that into the future globally. That's what, they, that's what the assignment was. So I remember the day where I was feeling desperate not knowing what to do. And I remember praying for some sort of guidance. Would you help me out here? I don't know where to go. I remember walking out of my office to the hall, one hall over, meeting a guy from Europe. He went to the Harvard equivalent, and the MIT equivalent of Europe. And he just struck up this conversation with me out of the blue about systems thinking. It's how to model complex situations. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, what I was hearing. It just struck me, I like, that, that is exactly what I needed. This is exactly what I needed. So I went and researched, learned about it, added this to my toolkit. I met with the owner, founder from MIT, who was, I think it, I think it was at Yale, where I went to travel to meet him and his company. And I went to sessions where I learned how this software and this thinking works. And in that session was the military modeling strategies, the World Health Organization modeling the, the diffusion of malaria. People doing heavy, meaty projects, and this was perfect. Um, interesting stuff, it's developed even beyond what I used. You might be interested, you might find yourself needing that kind of a tool someday. But the point I want to make here is that I knew, had no idea where to go. And at that time, I know I was helped to find just the right thing that I needed. And we developed this system, the most complex one that the company had done to date. And I had them working with me as consultants. We delivered it to the Dow Chemical Company and it exceeded their expectations. And it was used in the company for years afterwards to help that, the paper industry figure out where to put plants. But again, that was a tremendous blessing. I didn't do it. I know I was, in, I was being helped by somebody with much greater wisdom than I had. Let me give you another situation. This is the last example. PCC, for the last several years, maybe since Professor Priest left, we've been losing market share. Um, and you can see this is our total market share, all markets. It's been declining over the years. And if you want to know why, you don't have to go very far to figure it out. In the 1960s and 70s, we had very little competition. You see, got PCC in the middle there with our direct competitors in the small circle, the large circle, indirect competitors, and the outside there, you've got the beaches. You get to the 80s, to the 90s, it starts filling up. And this is statistically by how, when these different companies came online and were incorporated the best that we could find. 2000, 2009 to present. You go on TripAdvisor, 400 and, or 542 was the last count that I saw, activities or attractions on Oahu today. Is it any wonder we're losing market share? Oh, by the way, too, the average stay of a visitor is shorter. And it costs them a lot more for an air ticket and for a hotel room. So they have less money in their pocket when they're here. Any reason why we would be having a hard time? We're at a point to where we were going into the red because we didn't have enough revenue to sustain the fixed expenses we had at the center. So, Here's what we did, that's the circumstance. We tested price elasticity and that demand curve. I hope you've all had your economics classes, right? Pretty, pretty simple. If you reduce price, demand should go up, right? 
If you raise price, demand should go down. Well, not always the case. Every curve looks a little different. We tested that price elasticity because when I first got here, every, I was hearing from everybody, PCC is too expensive. I had board members telling us, man, you've got to reduce your price. PCC is just too much. So that, well, that makes good sense to me. Let's get more volume in here. We want more people to experience what PCC is anyway. So we tried it, by the way, without asking the customer first, and it was a nightmare. We had to reverse it after the first four months because we were bleeding like crazy. No, no additional people came. We got the same volume that we got. We just got a lot less money from them. So we, I think we lost about four million in that four months. So we reversed quickly, and from that point on, I said no more monkeying around with this without testing. So we conducted research to know the customer better, better than anybody else on the island. And I would stand up our research against even the state's own research that they spend millions for. We've done some incredible research and we're blessed to have some volunteer missionaries who are uh, um, professional career statisticians and researchers doing this work. We now know the customer quite well. And as a result, we began to promote, instead of promoting, our lead product was, what we had been promoting was our lowest price. Buy dinner, show, buy islands, show, and get dinner for free. You'd think that would appeal to anybody, right? Well, it turns out, no. Um, the same number of people, like I said, came. But we started promoting our higher end packages. Now our number one package by far, rough, almost half of our business is the Luau. Significantly more cost than the other packages we sold. Because that's what people wanted. They responded. And by the way, they really like the idea of getting an ambassador guide. Thanks for telling me about it. So we have almost doubled our ambassador sales at PCC. What does that do to your bottom line, do you think? Dramatically helped our revenue situation and our bottom line margin. So we also did a lot of things to drive sales directly to us. Um, so we would bypass the agents. Agents are taking 20 to 30% right off the top. If we could get people to come and buy from us directly, we're 20 to 30% ahead, right? Our cost, our cost of direct sales now is between six and 10% makes sense all day. So now our mantra is really do everything we can to sell direct and after all that we've done, if it doesn't work, then we'll let an agent pick up the what's left. So that's not an easy message for the agents. We got a little bit of backlash, but nothing significant to damage us. But um, what I, and by the way, by promoting pre-arrival, we avoid the bloody water of getting on the island and people getting slammed by all this promotional uh, literature. I mean, you get here and you don't know what you should do. But by promoting ahead of time, getting them committed to coming to PCC before they arrive, they've already committed to a day and a time with us, is what was happening before is people just, boy, sit on the beach and just one more day at the beach and I just ran out of time to go to PCC. We heard it over and over and over again. But the one that I really wanted to share, the action item that we took, was this last one. New and expanded online travel publication. So this is the lead publication on Oahu. So once people arrive, they're on the ground, this is what most people look at. There are a couple other variations. But in here, we've had ads for years. But I want to tell you there was and again, I, I hope you understand the spirit I'm sharing this. I don't think these came from me. Our team did all of these other things. But on this one point, I want to tell you, I remember where I was standing the moment that I had been praying out of desperation to what we could do to help PCC. Because I know the Lord loves PCC. This is His place. What do we do to help it be more successful? And that was my job. And I remember praying in my office, getting up, and getting an answer. And that answer was, 
Remember the research? 95% of the people know at PCC that it exists. They've heard of the Polynesian Cultural Center. They just don't know what it is. So I remember seeing clearly in my mind that we would not reduce our advertising, but we would increase it and we would become the centerfold middle of this, putting in our brochure map that helped people to understand all that PCC had to offer. Dramatically changed the results in our advertising. That was a big epiphany. We started doing that, we tested it, people loved it. They're like, oh, I had no idea that's what PCC was. I didn't know you could do all, it's 42 acres, and you go to six islands, they had no clue. All the money we had been putting into branding, so they know the name was not helping. We needed to focus the insert. We got calls from people in the industry, our competitors that said, that's a gutsy move. Well, you guys are paying a lot of extra. By the way, it didn't cost a lot of extra. We're just paying the cost of their paper because the publication wants to keep us here and they're hoping everybody else will follow us. So it's not a lot more, but it dramatically helped our results. So since 2014, our sales are up 28%, putting us well into the black again. And direct sales have gone from 24% of our total, direct meaning they come to us directly. They phone call, they buy a ticket at our box office, or they buy online. We were at 24, now it's 62. Huge help to our margin on our bottom line. But I just want to, I'm bring, I mention that only because a lot of things were done by a good team but this one little piece was pure inspiration. I know it was divine direct guidance. And I say that again because I know your Heavenly Father wants to help you to be successful in whatever you're doing. As long as your heart is in the right place and you're doing good things, He will help you. Re take advantage of that help. He wants to see you all succeed. So, those are my three pieces of advice. Keep filling your toolbox. Know the customer best, better than anybody else out there, and pray for help. It will come. As you do these things, I know you can be, you will be successful. You'll be the leaders that have been prophesied to go forward from this university. And uh, I look forward to watching you rise seeing pictures of you in the media, and uh, whatever that future holds for you. And, I, uh, and that's what I had to offer. Boy, I left the business. Um, I went, that was one of my six-month management rotations. So we got it started, but uh, I think they moved in a direction more towards um, um, fashion, uh, where there's higher margins and uh, the fashion industry was a little more open to it. Okay. It's implicit in the know the customer best because that's, it's all about the data. It's all about data, right? You make some assumptions, you have some guesses, and then you go test it on as large a group as possible or you take existing sales data and you learn what you can from it. It's absolutely critical. It used to be the Madison Avenue marketing scene. The creative guys would come up with something really brilliant and that's what they got paid for. No longer. That is no longer acceptable in business and in marketing. It's all about understanding the data and, and knowing your customer best through that data. Well, I'm not going to keep anybody else here. I don't know how you have a, a meeting through. Well, I'm not going to keep you from lunch. Yes. Uh, before. Uh,